Mathematics is, uh, sabi nila, the backbone of uh, all uh, culture. Uh, it is the backbone of uh, technology as well. Mathematics the key that gives an easy and a quick access to science and technology. And an area of knowledge that has vast applications not only to physical or natural sciences, but also to social sciences and humanities. Math is very important in our life. Uh, it governs the way we live, and there is a story in every number. PhD program here in Upidavia is a supplementing um, program uh, towards the development of uh, mathematics manpower. It's committed to the pursuit of excellence in teaching, research, and extension service within the university, the Northern Luzon region, and in our country. We are the only uh, institution offering PhD math uh, north of Manila, uh, and there are uh, very few uh, uh, institutions offering uh, PhD math. But we need uh, researchers in uh, mathematics, and it's not always the case that uh, mathematics uh, researchers and professors are able to go to Metro Manila to earn their PhDs, much less abroad, although we have uh, people already uh, being sent abroad to train for PhD. Nare-realize mo, dahil ang dahil palang hindi alam. Dahil pang dapat matutunan. Uh, kulang talaga yung BS and MS uh, math. And if, you, if your intention is to uh, teach, do research, do extension work as a mathematician, malaki ang may tutulong sa'yo ng isang uh, PhD degree. I'm not saying that you cannot uh, do all these things uh, without a PhD, pero marami, marami kang mas may contribute as a mathematician if you have uh, a degree in uh, a PhD degree in, in mathematics. If you are willing to help improve the quality of programs in your institutions and you want to contribute to the upgrading of tertiary and graduate mathematics instruction and research here in the Philippines, and you want to become prolific mathematicians, then you can be a student in our PhD mathematics program here in UP Baguio. Yung opportunities will open up for you eh, once you have a, a PhD degree, uh, whether you are in the academe or in the industry, depend, depending of course on, on the field that you, uh, that you specialize in. You know? Kasi sa industry din naman, uh, Yung mga nang yung needs sa industry, lag, lag, lalo naging highly specialized. Uh, yung degree mo in PhD uh, can help you uh, go into, into that kind of, of specialization. Uh, we are training a few uh, kumbaga breed of uh, mathematicians in this country, um, which makes them really unique and, and different from the rest. The others cannot compete with us no, in the region because we are the only um, PhD program with a pure mathematics program.
into modeling and uh, applied mathematics. That's a strength of many of our young PhD faculty. Uh, and so one can say that uh, in terms of uh, uh, applied uh, mathematics, mathematical modeling, and numerical methods, uh, the strength is quite solid. Uh, and so uh, among the programs uh, in the Philippines, I believe that uh, we can sort of take the lead. So our department aspires to the high standards of excellence in all aspects of teaching, research, and service. The faculty members of our de department have collaborated with fellow researchers from uh, other institutions here and abroad. Here in the Philippines, we have uh, UP Diliman, uh, De La Salle University, Ateneo, Mindanao State uh, University, Ligan Institute of Technology. In international uh, collaborations, we have uh, Kyoto University, uh, North Carolina State University, Vanderbilt University, University of Graz, and many more. I have very, very good mentors in math. So when they do enroll in this PhD program, I'm very sure they will have a very good training in mathematics. We have experts in the different fields of math. Very prestigious yung program mo kasi mga PhD yung nagtuturo. This is a program that would cater to the needs of the Cordillera and Northern Luzon. And therefore, it's a strategic move for us to have this program. So we have we have two more minutes. Uh, mag start na kaya tayo. Ready na po, sir. Uh, okay, so maybe we could start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the College of Science Lecture Series Committee uh, webinar series. So this is actually uh, the third lecture for this semester that uh, is sponsored by the Lecture Series Committee. So uh just to remind everyone with the uh, rules of netiquette so please mute your microphone and then be mindful of the background noise uh, and other stuff and if you want to ask your question please put them in in the q a tab so i'm sorry i so please ignore the 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 last sentence so put your questions on the q a tab so if you have questions, just put it in in the Q&A tab, and then later on, we'll just read it during the Q&A part. Okay. So just a brief uh, introduction with the College of Science Lecture Series Committee. So the members are the following. So we have the Dean, the College of Science Dean, uh, Dean Javier, and then uh, yours, uh, yours truly. And then we have the following uh, members of the committee. So we have Professor Joel Adawe of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, uh, Professor Ashlyn Balangkod, uh, uh, also in the with the DMCS, but she's also with the Computer Science Program. Uh, Professor Jocelyn Floresca of the Human Kinetics Program. Uh, Professor Patrick Peñales of the Department of Biology, 
and Professor Wendell Santos of the Department of uh, Physical Sciences. Physical Sciences. And also, uh, we, we did get a lot of help from the following office. So we have the Office of the Public Affairs of UP Baguio, and also with the uh, Systems and Network Office of UP Baguio. Okay. So those are the, the members of the College of Science Lecture Series Committee. Okay, so the talk for today is actually part of the celebration of the National Science and Technology Week uh, by the, the Department of Science and Technology. So the week, uh, November 23 to 29, 2020 is actually the National Science and Technology Week. And the theme for this year is Sandigan ng Kalusugan, Kabuhayan, Kaayusan at Kinabukasan. Uh, science for the people. Okay, so for the program schedule, so I think we're right on time. So the talk will be about 30 minutes, so from 3.45 to 3, uh, 4.15. And then after the talk, we have a five-minute break. So the break is for you to, to do the survey. So if you want to receive a certificate, you need to include your name and then answer a survey. And then it's also the time for us to gather your questions. So after the break, we're going to have a 30-minute open forum uh, Q&A. So if you have a lot of questions, we'll discuss it during this period of time. And then after the Q&A, we're going to have the closing remarks and the awarding of uh, certificates. Okay. okay. So let me call on Dr. Joel Adawe to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Sir Wancho. And uh, it is an honor to introduce the speaker for today's webinar. And uh, hopefully you will be attending the succeeding webinars that will be handled by the College of Science. Okay. Please uh, uh, watch on the Facebook and uh, UP web website, okay? So, uh, to introduce uh, our next speaker is uh, Paul Samuel uh, P. Ignacio. And uh, he is our uh, graduate at UP Baguio uh, in uh, 2010. He finished his BS Mathematics, cum laude. And uh, in 2013, he finished his MS Mathematics at the University of the Philippines uh, Baguio before he pursued his PhD uh, abroad. And in 2016, uh, he also uh, finished his MS Mathematics at University of Iowa and uh, currently, uh, recently finished his PhD uh, in 2019 at the University of Iowa, USA. Okay. And uh, he is currently an associate uh, professor uh, at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, under the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. And uh, he has uh, taught uh, graduate and undergraduate courses. And uh, he was able to uh, publish uh, peer-reviewed uh, peer papers uh, recently uh, the uh, paper classification of single lead electrocardiograms, TDA informed machine learning in proceedings 2019 uh, 18 IEEE conference uh, in Baton Roca, Florida. And also uh, his uh, recent publication uh, under uh, Darcy, uh, his uh, advisor. Uh, tight, entitled Tracing Patterns and Shapes in Remittance and Migration Networks via Persistent Homology, published in EPJ Data Science 2019. And there are uh, several other papers uh, that it was able to publish. He was also, uh, was also invited and in, uh, give talks in uh, several uh, conferences and uh, his recent uh, conference talks were uh, 
about his uh, PhD or his dissertation. Okay? So classification of single lead cardiograms. And uh, other conferences, I think I don't have enough uh, time to really uh, read all his uh, uh, presentations and uh, poster presentations. And uh, he was also able to attend uh, several uh, conferences abroad. Uh, recently, uh, our, uh, the one in uh, 34th Summer Conference on Topology in Johannesburg, uh, July 2019. Okay. And uh, also the AMS and MAA joint mass meeting in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. Without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, call on our uh, speaker for uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, Dr. Paul Samuel T. E. Ignacio. Thank you, Sir Joel, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the lecture series committee for having me and inviting me to uh, do this talk. I'm really excited to give this talk. I, I am seeing uh, familiar names in the in the audience right now. So I'm really excited to share with, with you what I do with math. And my talk today, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right, so I'm just making sure. All right, so my talk today uh, is about um, a new area in mathematics, a relatively young field in mathematics. And my talk today um, uh, is entitled Shapes in Data, uh, an Invitation to Topological Data Analysis. So here's the outline of my talk. So let me begin with some uh, very short message, uh, uh, an advertisement, and then I uh, will uh, develop intuition on what we mean by uh, shapes in data, and then what uh, what sort of information we get from these shapes. So uh, we will do this with uh, some survey uh, of my favorite landmark applications of TDA out there. And then I'll give a very terse and basic introduction to TDA. So we'll talk about the math behind uh, TDA. Don't worry, I know that the, the audience is a general audience. So I'll, I'll talk about everything in general terms. So you're, you'll be able to follow uh, everything that I say. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing in TDA here in UP Baguio. So, here we go. So the first um, uh, thing that I want to say is that um, the Cordillera, Cordillera Study Center produced a, a podcast of, a, of an interview uh, with the same topic. So basically, the things that I'll be saying here um, are also, you can also listen to this podcast and hear about uh, similar, similar stuff. So if you're interested in doing that, please visit the Cordillera Study Center uh, website and look for the CSE Field Notes episode 17. And you can list, listen on the podcast via Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All right, so much about that. So, so let's um, let's start by developing some intuition on what we really mean by uh, uh, when we say that data has shape or shapes in data. So the catchphrase of, uh, of, of uh, TDA, of topological data analysis, is that data has shape and shape has meaning. So this is due to Professor Carlson of Stanford uh, in 2009. And what we do in TDA is that instead of we instead of thinking about uh, uh, TDA as, a, or uh, thinking about data as just a bunch of numbers with uh, several descriptors, what we do is we in incarnate every, um, we think of data as a geometric object basically. So every observation in your data set, you, um, incarnate as a point uh, in high dimensional space where, uh, so say for example, if you have data and it has several descriptors, so for example, that uh, if you consider these uh, data points, so it, perhaps there's a, there's a name uh, in, the, in your data or some other descriptors, what we do is we use every descriptor as a coordinate in high dimensional space. So if you think about it, uh, this data about Aling Rosing becomes a point in, the, uh, in high dimensional space, in this case in R3. So if you have many more uh, descriptors, you, are, you have a point in high dimensional space, in a higher dimensional space. So if you do that for every point, now, so there's only three of here, three points here, but then if, if you have many, you have like a collection of uh, points in high dimensional space. Um, and to give it to an idea of, of uh, a, a general description of the shape of your collection of points, the problem with uh, this uh, transformation is that discrete points have trivial topology. So there's no um, 
nothing interesting about just points. So instead of looking at just points, we're looking at the entire collection of points in high, in high dimensional space. And we do that to, to, to classify or to describe the collection of points, we endow it with a mathematical object that captures the overall sh shape of the, the points. So by the way, we call the, those collection of points a point cloud because it looks like a cloud, like a, a collection of particles, right? And we, uh, uh, to, to get a sense of what is the overall shape of the data, we endow it with an al al uh, algebraic structure uh, that we can um, examine the shape of. So somehow we, we use that as a proxy for the shape of the data. So that's what we do here. So instead of looking at the data as just a sequence of numbers, a series of numbers, we look, it, look at it as a, a geometric shape and then we proxy the, the, the point cloud with a, an al algebraic object and then we study that under the lens of topology. And so, so what kind of uh, shape descriptions do we extract from that proxy? So um, these are shapes that are um, distinguishing features of, the, of that object, of that mathematical object. And I'll describe that later in, later in the talk. So these features are those that do not change under uh, continuous transformations or coordinate change, or even if you change perspective. So for example, if you think about this as, so say for example, this is that object that proxies the, the shape of the, the data, right? So this is an annulus. Uh, you can think of it as a thickened uh, circle, right? So uh, one way to describe this would be, well, it's in one shape, right? You can go from one point to any other point in the annulus. And then even if you stretch this, so think about this as say like a rubber band, right? If you, uh, even if you stretch it or if you contract it, as long as you don't cut it, right? The, the annulus is still in one piece. So that's one of the distinguishing features that uh, remains invariant, even if you stretch or contract the, the, the rubber band. Another one is that it bounds a disk because there's, so there's sort of a two dimensional hole in the middle, right? As opposed to say, for example, a figure of eight, which has two holes in the middle. So those are the distinguishing features. And even if you change in perspective, uh, those uh, features remain. So these are the, sh when we say about, when we talk about uh, shape in data, this is what we mean. We talk about the, um, shape of that proxied object, object, uh, abstract object that proxies for the, the shape of the data. And so why do we do this? Like, so what, what sort of information do we get from this, the shape? So here's a very naive example, just to get an intuition of what we are really doing here. So consider the collection of, um, of photographs here. And uh, let's assume that there are only really four objects here. Um, it doesn't repeat. So we have this freakishly purple person and then this um, a flower, and then we have this, uh, moon and then the, the cloud. So the idea is that, so th these photos are taken in succession, right? And so um, from the, just this collection uh, of, of photos, we are actually able to infer the order of at uh, which the, the objects appear. So see, if you look at, take a look at this photo and this photo, they have a common object, the flower, right? So you, it's, uh, it's natural to think that the order should be this, that a purple person, the flower, and then the, the moon. And then if you look at this picture, then the moon is followed by the cloud, but then the cloud is again followed by the, the, the purple person. So there's only one way to go about this if the photos are taken in succession, right? And the, the, the photos, the, the, the objects are being in the photos are close to each other, then this is the, the, the uh, what's the term for that? This is the uh, configuration of the objects. And, uh, and that's the information that we sort of extract just from the observing the patterns, uh, uh, the pattern in the, uh, in, in the photos, right? So the, the circular shape is the shape of the data and um, we are able to uh, um, uh, what's, uh, recover that. That's the term that I was looking for. Here's another example. So consider this collection of colors uh, that light up and they are generated in a hidden sequence. And the idea is we want to recover that hidden sequence. And the, the thing is, if the, group, the colors light up simultaneously, that means that they represent subsequence in that hidden, hidden se sequence. So seemingly the, the, the colors seem to light up in um, random order and there's a sort of chaos here, but if we look close enough and if we assume that um, if we want to recover some sort of pattern here, let's, let's assume that the colors will light up if they um, are close by. Okay, so if we have that, if we do that assumption, then suddenly we, saw, we see some pattern, right? So if you see, observe every, uh, every pair of color that, uh, colors that light up, then we, and then we position uh, one color to another if they light up simultaneously, we suddenly see that the, act, the pattern actually loops, 
Okay, so uh, if we if we do that, if we position this point close to this point because they appear in one frame, for example, in one a snapshot, and then we are able to recover this um, uh, uh, configuration, and we see that it, the the pattern actually loops the sequence loops, and this is sort of the shape that we get from here. So what's what's nice about this, or what sort of information, or is this actually usable, right? What if we can get this shape? Is is it actually um, useful for us? So the thing is, this is actually exactly what this paper did. So um, uh, this paper examined um, or studied the place cells in the in the brain of uh, mice. So uh, in the brain, there are uh, specific regions that are associated to a specific place. If you go to a new place, and then your brain starts associating one place to a specific region or specific cells. So those cells are called place cells, right? So what they did was they attached sensors in the brain of mice, and then they let the mice uh, run around an obstacle course. And then this, they looked at the regions of the brain that are basically most active. And then they tracked the, um, the let's just say, lighting up of that region, uh, regions of the brain. And just by looking at the patterns, okay, uh, when regions of the brains would simultaneously light up, they, they considered that uh, um, association, they were able to recover um, the shape or the topology or the configuration of the obstacle course that the rice that the rice the mice ran around. So if you think about it, it's exactly this one. So you think about the, the colors as the place cells lighting up and they light up if um, they are close by or the, the, the place that are associated to them are close by, then they they were able to recover the shape of the, the obstacle course that the, the mice ran into. So this is one of my favorite favorite applications of DD out there. Another one that has been done is the um, uh, analysis of time series data. So if you have a time series, right, um, uh, you can actually recover uh, periodic information about uh, the time series. Uh, the strategy that we use is called a sliding window embedding. So the general pipeline is this again. You have data, in this case, a time series. You embed it into a high dimensional space, a point cloud. So what's the strategy in this case? So first, you, you fix a window. So say, for example, this is a window. And the idea is that we will take snapshots of the time series, right? And so that represents that particular local information about the time series. And then um, we embed it as a, a point in high dimensional space. So how do we do that? So for example, this is your window. You just select endpoints from it, or end time values from the, the time series. And then for each value, you will use it as a coordinate in high dimensional space. So if you have, if you select endpoints, you have a vector in R to the N. So you have a point in uh, R to the N. So if, for example, if you choose N to be three, right? Select three points here, you get a point in R3. Okay. So again, each window represents a snapshot, a local, uh, 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 a record of the local information about the time series. So if you slide the window over, you repeat the process, you get another point. Right? So if you do that over and over again, what you get is uh, you're, you're generating this, the snapshots as points in high dimensional space. And the idea is that, think about it, if you have two snapshots that are similar, right, they will be embedded in the same point in the high dimensional space. So the catch is that if there is anything periodic about the time series, then it will translate into, into a cycle in high dimensional space. And that's a, uh, a shape description that we can detect using, using TDA. Okay, so, and this is exactly what they did in this paper. This is another of my favorite paper um, uh, using the application of TDA. And I'll talk about more, more about this strategy later in, uh, in uh, local work that we did. Um, they were able to detect the periodicity in time series data uh, that some of the uh, state-of-the-art methods were missed, uh, especially in the presence of NAMPing. So, so the, we know now that we, this can be useful, right? So we can detect data um, uh, or shapes in data, and then these data give us um, um, useful information about the underlying data. So how do we actually do this? So um, here's the math behind it. So again, I will talk in general terms. So, um, um, oops, sorry. So this will be accessible to everyone. So suppose you have a collection of points sampled from an annual. So say, for example, the, the annual shape that we, we had earlier. And we suppose we, we didn't know that. We just know it's a sample point, set of sample points. But we didn't know that it's sampled from an annulus. And we want to recover that information. So again, that the thing with trivial points is that they have trivial topology. There's nothing interesting about it. So we start adding some structure to it. right? So um, what we'll do is that if the points are close enough, if the points are close enough, we'll connect them, right? So, um, so 
to have a, ju a, 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 a judgment call on what is close enough, we need a distance. So that's what is, why the first step is to choose a distance. So this will be a ruler and we'll judge all distances using this ruler. If two points are at most this distance apart, we connect them, right? So that's equivalent to saying that if you put, or if you draw a, a balls around uh, each point of diameter this distance, okay, two points that are at most distance, this, this distance apart will intersect. So that's exactly what we do. So there you have it. I drew the balls. If the balls intersect, then we connect them. Okay, so if you do that, we sort of get the general structure of an annulus, right? But the problem here is that there are too many holes involved. So for example, here, there's a hole here, there's a hole here, there's a hole here, there's too many of that, right? And we just want to detect this central hole uh, that is the characterizing feature of an annulus. So uh, one thing that we can do is that we decide that if you have a collection of points that are pairwise connected, then we fill that space in. So for example, here, you have a triangle one, two, three points, and pairwise they are connected, right? So we fill that we fill that space in. So we do that for tetrahedron as well and for higher dimensional objects. So when we do that, we 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 solve that problem of having too many holes. And see here, this whole central hole is the one that we want to detect, right? And now we can describe this object, this mathematical object, and this one has uh, features that. Uh, or, or uh, the topological features of this or the shape would be it's in one piece, right? There's only one uh, connected component and there's a, a hole in the middle. So there's a loop present inside. So, but there's a caveat in this, in this process. Uh, remember the first step that we did was to choose a distance. So the question is, how do we naturally choose the distance T, right? So the thing is, if you choose it to be too small, then these are the same points that we had but so if D, your, your D is too small, then you don't even detect the hole here, the central hole that we want. Yes, we do detect a hole here, but that is not the hole that we want, right? But then if you choose your D, uh, your distance to be too big, then we don't even see the hole anymore, right? So the question is, what is the way, or how do we go about it, right? How do we solve the problem? What, what is the right distance to choose? So what TDA proposes is that we don't ask or answer that question. Instead, we just, we just do all distances. So notice that, so, and, and why, why is that? So notice that there's a distance that's just uh, large enough for a hole to appear. So for example, this distance is just large enough for this feature to appear. So we, we sort of detect it here and then uh, increase it a bit, a bit more. Then we see that uh, there's a distance that's, that's just small enough for it to close up, right? So if we, uh, if we um, uh, it successively increase the uh, the distance, right? And we keep track of the features that that the uh, parameter values at which uh, features appear and disappear. Then we get a sense of how important that feature is. So let me play a movie for you. So here I do the same, right? So we have these uh, points here, and then um, the points here. There are as many points as bars here. So the blue point. Uh, the blue bars here correspond to the pieces of the data. So for example, this is one piece, this is another piece. Right? So everything starts off as its own bar here. And then when it starts merging, then we see this only as one piece now, right? So if you look at it, this is really not two pieces anymore. It's only one piece because they are connected, right? So when that happens, one of the bars uh, will die. So corresponding to the, the, the point that gets uh, merged to another one. And so if you, I play and so I do, I do this, um, continuously. And then uh, at some point we will get red bars. So what do the red bars mean? So the red bars detect the cycles, the loops, uh, the circles, if you will. Then uh, for, for example, these two here represent the circles that uh, were born here, but then eventually get killed off. Okay, so that's why the bars uh, are terminated here. So again, think about the bars as tracking the importance or the longevity of the feature detected. And we get to this uh, bar here, uh, which uh, captures that information. And we know that the, yes, the cycle has already been born here, but at some, just a little more, it will die, right? So if you do that, yes, that hole closes up and that bar dies. But eventually we get to this point. This point captures the main feature that we want to detect uh, as opposed to the previous bars that capture small persistence, right? We expect this because this is the main feature. If we continue the movie, and then uh, this will lag a bit, but if you think about it, that feature that was born at time here is still alive here, still alive here, and then eventually it gets filled in, okay? And so in, in this exercise, we see that the if we do this practice, the bars that are persistent or the features that are significant are 
captured by the bars that uh, uh, persist for a long time. So persist here means that um, um, the death time is a lot larger than the birth time. Okay, so yeah, so this is the this is the way that we detect that the, those shapes that I was talking about earlier. So this is the way that we do that. The significant features of the point cloud get detected by by the, um, the significant bars in the bar code. So this collection of bars. Okay, let me just um, wait for the next slide to load. So this collection of bars is called the barcode. It's just a collection of bars. And the nice thing about this uh, barcode, so this is the output of uh, TDA, of persistent homology, the main uh, theory behind TDA. Um, uh, the main feature why we can use it for data analysis is that, yes, we are able to, de to detect the shape. And in fact, this output is stable. So what does that mean? If you change it a bit, I mean, if you perturb the points a little, if you move the points a little, the corresponding output, the barcode, will only change by a bit. So this is important because now we can compare the output for any two uh, sets of data, right? So this uh, stability result is um, um, credited to Cohen, Steiner, Els, Brunner, and Ayer in 2017. And uh, uh, also, um, it's actually an algebraic signature as well. So. You might be thinking, well, how do we actually uh, capture that barcode? Do we, do, we, do we watch the movie every time and then keep track of all the features that's being born and killed off at some time? Actually, the answer is no. So in, in our uh, process, as we increase the threshold, uh, for example, if you take a time slice, right, you can actually assign to that object that we create, the triangles, the lines, and the tetrahedron and higher dimensional stuff. If you collect those, you can assign an algebraic object to that. So I'll just say it's a vector space, so it's a mathematical object. And then for each time slice, you will have one of that, right? And the, the successive uh, in, uh, uh, increase in the threshold actually induces maps between these uh, vector spaces. So we have linear maps here induced by inclusion. And uh, the nice thing about uh, these collection is that, so the, again, these are algebraic objects. These are mathematical objects. And if you collect these objects with together with the map, that again forms another mathematical object called a module. Okay? The nice thing about this module is that you can decompose it nicely okay? so into this form. So I won't talk about this in more detail, but I just want to say that uh, if you collect those, uh, mathematical objects, it forms another uh, mathematical object, which you can write nicely. And why is it nice? Well, the, it turns out that um, this decomposition follows this form. The, the uh, bars here uh, that don't die, so these are the features that are born sometime, um, but then they never die, they are perpetual. You can collect those in one part. And then the features okay, that you detect uh, that are born at some time, but then they die eventually, you can collect that at, some, at another part of it. And it, so if you think about it, um, the bars that we, we extracted later, uh, later earlier when we watched the movie, you can actually compute it. So this is a nice thing. And there's actually an algorithm for that. Uh, it's computable by linear algebra. So the key takeaway here is that once you study data and you have an output for it, the barcode, the barcode is actually computable and it's also stable, so that, which makes it um, amenable for uh, data analysis. So all right, let's see if I'm good with time. OK, I'm not good with time, so let me move on. So here are just uh, some of the projects that we are doing here in UB Baguio. So uh, when I got back last year, I started the TDA group. So it started in August 2019. And the, so far, the, the, the focus of our group is, has been on the integration of topological features to machine learning. So that's one nice thing about TDA. Um, the shapes that we detect, you can actually arrange that as a vector and feed it into a machine learning algorithm that it can use for a specific tasks like classification or regression tasks. And uh, another focus has been on the improvement of computational tools in TDA. Because it's so young, there's a lot that we can do, but it's um, hurdled by the computational tools available out there. So this has been one focus of our group in, in UP Baguio. So I'd like to uh, boast about this project. This is uh, one project that we've been working on. It's in, it's in uh, infancy stage. Um, we're actually <laughs> waiting for um, funding for this project, but we have an initial model for this. So what we did is that we, we took an ECG data, so an ECG data, an electrocardiogram data, um, uh, and then we um, took specific parts of it, and then we, we put it in the pipeline of TDA, and we were able to generate a model that uh, uh, classifies your ECG uh, 
according to specific or uh, several uh, cardiac conditions, right? So if, if you give us your ECG, we can feed it into the model and then the model gives you a diagnosis of your uh, heart condition, whether you're normal or do you have a specific heart condition. So this is it's in, uh, in its infancy stage. The current model uh, performs well in um, discriminating, con discriminating condition positive from condition negative ECGs, but we, there's still a lot to improve, right? <laughs> so currently we have, um, very good um, true positive rates, but we can still improve it in, 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 in other areas. Okay, so that's one. The, this initial uh, model has been presented uh, in the uh, Computing in Cardiology conference in, in September. Um, and, and I'm giving a shout out to my students, JN and Janrik. Um, I, I was with them when, when they presented this work in the, the conference, and this will appear in, uh, in the proceedings, uh, Computing in Cardiology 2020. So if you're interested, look it up. But there's a lot more to be done uh, to um, refine this, this project. Another work that we are very proud of too is uh, on the um, development of a computational tool. So, and it, we, we um, okay, so remember the barcodes earlier, the output of TDA, those uh, bars, collection of bars, the, um, the way to compare that, the two outputs, two barcodes, is using this uh, metric. So it's called the, the bottleneck distance. Uh, it's defined this way. <coughs> uh, but what I want to emphasize here is this is really a pain to compute because you need to take all, consider all bijection. So for each bar, in, so you have two barcodes, right? Um, you pair up one bar to another and then you measure distances and then um, Oh, sorry, you have one bar barcode to another, you pair up the, the bars and then you measure distances. And then you consider that for all possible pairings. So think about it, if you have a bar with a million bars, a barcode with a million bars and another one with a million where there's, there's too much uh, uh, combinations uh, to consider. And so this is really, that's why it's called the bottleneck distance because it takes forever to compute. And <laughs> it's the main uh, metric to compare the output of TDA. So, what we were able to do is that we were able to uh, uh, develop a new algorithm that bypasses this matching problem. And we called it Lumawi. This is a, we are very proud of this name. So this is a name of an Igorot God. Um, uh, it's an efficient algorithm for computing dimensions here, bottleneck distance uh, in TDA. So here are, here's, I'll just give you some uh, graphs to uh, get an idea of how, how good the, the, the result here. So currently the per outperforms all publicly available implementations of the bottleneck distance. So there are four currently, so ours, there's Hera, there's Dionysus, and there's Persim. So uh, if you can see here, uh, so the, the x-axis here would be the number of points in the bars. So remember the barcodes, uh, the number of bars in the, each barcode. And then here is the running time. So the best, the state of the art is Hera. Okay, so, and this is the graph of Hera as you increase the number of points. So uh, at points up to 500 points, we, we beat it, okay? But we were not uh, satisfied with that. So we computed up to 30,000 points. So here is Hera again, and this is in log scale. So if you think about it, this is really more pronounced, the, the, the advantage here. So uh, in terms of running time, we beat everything else. Uh, in fact, even in the computation, the, the, the accuracy, ours is actually fast, uh, uh, closer. Uh, we provide a closer approximate than any other um, implementations of the bottleneck distance out there. And in terms of time complexity, um, we haven't done the theoretical side yet, but the computational uh, side shows that the, the growth is just linear. So here we, we got to up to a million points, and this is the first time that we were able to compare barcodes of with a million points. So um, we are very happy with that. And uh, this appears in this uh, paper uh, recently published. Uh, <clears throat> if so, if you're interested, uh, uh, feel free to look it up. It will also be presented in the prestigious conference NeurIPS in December. Okay, so let's see. I don't have time, so let me just mention some of these uh, other projects quickly. So the, the other stuff that we are looking at would be um, we are developing other clustering algorithms or other measures in networks, uh, in network analysis that are influenced by TDA. So we're trying to leverage the information that we can get uh, using TDA to design new algorithms for clustering or um, new measures for networks. Another one is to leverage the viral phenomenon in signal analysis. This is, I have a student working on this. And then we, we like I said, the, the cardiac falls into this one. Well topological time series, but we're also able to uh, apply this in financial data. So stock data, basically, 
and we are also into um, analysis of images, digits, and uh, text. Okay, so in conclusion, um, here are just four points. Um, TDA is a very uh, new field in mathematics. It's less than 20 years old, so there's a lot of many exciting applications. There's a lot of things that still can be done. Uh, it's compatible with data science, so if you're interested with a, a career in data science, uh, TDA is a good training with that. And there is also a shortage of researchers working in TDA in the Philippines. I can name everyone that I know, at least uh, using the fingers in both my hands. So if you are interested to work in this area, reach out to me. Here's my uh, email address. And thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Sir Paul. So you. maybe uh, we'll ask Sir Wancho. Okay. Uh, okay. So we have. I think we have like five minutes break to to gather the questions and also for the participants to uh, do the survey for their certificates. So let's have a five minute break. Wancho, share mo siguro yung pan. video, five minutes. Mathematics is a uh, Sabi nila the backbone of uh, all uh, culture. Uh, it is the backbone of uh, technology as well. Mathematics is the key that gives an easy and a quick access to science and technology. And an area of knowledge that has vast applications not only to physical or natural sciences, but also to social sciences and humanities. Math is very important in our life. Uh, it governs the way we live, and there is a story in every number. PhD program here in UP Baguio is a supplementing um, program uh, towards the development of uh, mathematics manpower. It's committed to the pursuit of excellence in teaching, research, and extension service within the university, the Northern Luzon region, and in our country. We are the only uh, institution offering PhD math uh, north of Manila, uh, and there are uh, very few uh, uh, institutions offering uh, PhD math. But we need uh, researchers in uh, mathematics, and it's not always the case that uh, mathematics uh, researchers and professors are able to go to Metro Manila to earn their PhDs, much less abroad, although we have uh, people already uh, being sent abroad to train for PhD. Dahil, 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 dahil
dapat matutunan uh, kulang talaga yung BS and MS uh, math and if you if your intention is to uh, teach do research do extension work as a mathematician malaki ang may tutulong sa yung uh, PhD degree i'm not saying that you cannot uh, do all these things uh, without a PhD pero marami marami kang mas may ko contribute as a mathematician if you have uh, a degree in uh, a PhD degree in, in mathematics If you are willing to help improve the quality of programs in your institutions and you want to contribute to the upgrading of tertiary and graduate mathematics instruction and research here in the Philippines and you want to become prolific mathematicians, then you can be a student in our PhD mathematics program here in UP Baguio. Yung opportunities will open up for you eh, once you have a, a PhD degree, uh, whether you are in the academe or in the industry, depend, depending of course on, on the field that you, uh, that you specialize in. Ano? Kasi sa industry din naman, uh, yung mga nang yung needs sa industry, lag, lag, lalo naging highly specialized. Uh, yung degree mo in PhD uh, can help you uh, go into, into that kind of, of specialization. Uh, we are training a few uh, kumbaga breed of uh, mathematicians in this country um, which makes them really unique and, and different from the rest. The others cannot compete with us no, in the region because we are the only um, PhD program with a pure mathematics program. Okay, we're we're back. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's thank again, uh, Doctor Paul Ignacio, for the very interesting talk. Uh, we have a few questions here. So. Okay. Yep. Yeah, hello. Okay. <laughs> So the first question is from uh, John Sebastian Simon. So as I understand, the analysis relies on the periodicity mm -hmm. of data. If this is the case, how is TDA applied to uh, ML, given that most tests done mm -hmm. for ML are chaotic in nature? Okay, so um, I clarify ko lang the, the periodicity application kanina, uh, the, that uses a specific kind of data, uh, in particular time series data. So yung transformation na introduced natin relies on the periodicity to transform it as a geometric feature. So in general, you don't have to use a, a time series data, you can use TDA for any kind of, uh, of data. So yung uh, statement na it relies on periodicity, that's not generally true. Um, if your data is time series, yes, that's true. Okay. But in general, you don't need that time series data. Okay, thank you. So I hope that answers your questions. Uh, second question is from uh, Lee Habiliana. Can TDA be used to detect or find patterns in a sequence of numbers? Okay, the general answer is yes. The hard answer or the long answer is it depends on how you will represent the numbers as objects. Right, so uh, if you think about it, how the, the, the tricky part is how do you convert the, the patterns as shapes? So if, if it's the, the question of detecting, yes, definitely the, the, the TDA can do that, the, the, pat, the pattern detection. The question is, what is the link between the shape and the pattern, in particular for number sequences? I haven't seen any application that uses that. Okay, so let's just uh, continue on with the questions here in Zoom. Okay, so third question is from uh, Anonymous. Is TDA similar to principal component analysis? In some sense, uh, well, um, it depends on the, 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 the focus of the question. So for, for PCA, right, the, the goal is to reduce the variables. So in, in TDA, actually, if it's in that sense, it's different. 
because in TDA, we actually don't drop any variable. So we endow all the information in the point, in the geometric object, uh, as opposed to TDA that, or in, in PCA that you're concerned with uh, or throwing out variables that are um, unimportant or um, with low variability. So in TDA, the focus is we endow the, we, we used all bits of information and we don't forget any, anything else. Okay. Okay, so let's just continue with the questions. Uh, this one is from uh, Maria Bardiaga. Is it possible to apply TDA in other laboratory imaging like CT scan, MRI, or PET scan? Yes, definitely. I've seen a paper that actually does that. So if you think about the, the picture, right? So um, um, if you have a picture of a brain, I think the what what MRI captures is the flow of the of the of blood in the brain. I think I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as long as you, as you have a picture and you can re represent it as a, 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 how do I say it? As the features that you want are specific shapes, like the holes, for example, in, in the MRI, then definitely you can. Okay. okay so next question. I don't is know from... what the PET scan is. So. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> There are also from, some questions in the art answered uh, section because I already answered some okay. earlier. There's one from Hob Nable. You know, <laughs> sir. <Nable. laughs> Hello, sir. <John. laughs> are, are there methods within TDA that can compare sets or classes or categories of data so that maybe one can decide if a data is of this type or other? Um, compare sets or classes of. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Like for uh, ito, ito ba, sir, I limbawa yung data mo ay um, ano ba? Uh, can you please elaborate more on this, sir? Medyo um, just to compare different sets. So yeah, I think he, he said about uh, categories of data. So maybe there's a way of so like, like classification classes of data, differentiating data. Or sets of data. Hmm. So I'm I'm not sure if we, um if it has been done. So the thing is, you, you have two if you have two types of data, right? So somehow you will represent one as a, a, a geometric object and another one, and you sort of compare them. Right? So I guess you can do that, but I'm not sure if the comparison will make sense. Maybe that's a that's a way to do it. Okay, we have the next question from uh, Rostum Alanas. Ano po, ano pa po ang mga weaknesses and scope ng TDA besides from the availability, availability of data points? Definitely computational tools. <laughs> so the, the, the main workhorse of TDA is persistent homology and the current algorithm for that is very slow. So the, the complexity is cubic in the number of simplices. So think about it, if you have many points, you have the number of simplices explodes. So if you have many simplices, the runtime also suffers. So really at this point in time, um, that's one, yung computational tool, and yung two, yung synergy with uh, um, with machine learning. So yeah, the, the thing with the barcode is that, um, um, how do I say this? For If you use a barcode, um, there's no, sense of what is an average barcode. So you have to go appeal to another kind of um, uh, summary where that has that specific property. Okay, uh, there's a follow-up question from Liha Bellana. Uh, do you know of any study or research that uses TDA to analyze the sequence of numbers generated by pseudo-random generators? I don't. This is actually a good idea. I, I haven't seen one that does this. Another question from anonymous mm -hmm. attendee. Uh, is the barcode a sufficient statistic? Very good question. This is a, a brilliant question. The answer is no. So there are there are other summaries that um, have been proposed uh, precisely for that reason. We, we don't have a sense of what is the statistics uh, for the space of barcodes. So there's this uh, other statistic called the persistence landscapes. The nice thing about that is it has, uh, uh, you can define a, uh, an inner product space there. So you have many properties that, uh, uh, so, so the landscapes would be functions. So you can appeal to that uh, space of uh, summers instead. And that has a central limit theorem. So it has many properties. So the, the, the track that uh, most people do is 
actually appeal to that instead of the barcode. Okay, uh, there's a follow up uh, for the question of uh, Hob Nable. Uh, say chaotic versus non chaotic. Oh, okay. Uh, that makes sense, actually. So you can compare. I think in, in that sense, you can definitely use TDA for that because then if you think about it, chaotic data will have uh, features that are not non-significant, non meaning small persistence. But then if you have organized data, then it's more likely that you will produce more uh, patterns that are organized. So for example, the shapes, the circles, the loops, you have a higher chance of getting those, the more significant features. So definitely in that sense, yes. Okay. So there's a question from anonymous attendee. Uh, how can TDA be applied in pandemic or epidemic analysis? Okay, so in, in, in pandemic, um, I haven't, uh, the thing is I haven't played with pandemic data. So I guess what you can do is um, if you think about the pandemic data as a network, right? So one upper, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, an infected person could be one vertex, right? And then um, all the, the uh, susceptible will be other vertices related. It, if, if you somehow can transform pandemic data into a network, right? You can use TTDA to capture um, patterns within that. So for example, you can also make it directed. So there's actually another branch of TDA that does that. So you can direct, um, you can make your uh, infected person like the source and then the, uh, uh, the susceptible person the, like the target. And so you have like a directed graph and then there's a branch of TDA that actually uses that. Okay, so there's a question from the email from Mark uh, Delara of UPLB. Uh, can you measure the bottleneck distance between barcodes from two point clouds of different sizes? Say yes, you can. point cloud of 10 points and a point right. cloud of 12 points. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah, and I think that the, this question arises with a matching, right? So the idea is what if you have two barcodes that have different number of bars? The what, what, one thing you can do is you can consider points in the diagonal. So if you Notice in my presentation, there's this that delta there. So if one barcode has more, you add points in the diagonal to match it. Okay, uh, next question, more questions, <laughs> damn questions. From uh, uh, Paul Vincent Botin, does TDA can be used in geodata analysis? Is there any article citation you may recommend? Thank you. I, I think there there's one. So I know of uh, of another uh, PhD working in the uh, one of the national laboratories in the U.S. They are they were using satellite data. Um, I haven't seen their paper yet, but um, uh, if so, they she told me about this last year. So if they finished it, it's probably out there already. So. Um, yes, I know some people working on this geodata data analysis. Um, I, I think there's also one person that uh, used uh, like weather data, like data with typhoons. Um, I think it's out there. I just don't know the title of the, the paper at the top of my head. Okay. So another question from Romel Rial. What sort of theoretical result, results are of interest in TDA? Okay. So the one at least for me, and I'm partial about this because uh, we have an algorithm for the bottleneck distance. The thing is in TDA, one of the cornerstone result, theoretical result is the stability. If we didn't have stability, it won't be, we won't be able to use it for data analysis. And uh, that result is written in the language of bottleneck distances. And so there are some, some critiques on the bottleneck distance. And right now there are, are other, uh, people are developing other ways of approving stability with, in terms of other metrics. So if you can define a new metric that has better properties in the bottleneck, then I think that's a, it's a, that's a good result, theoretical result. Okay. So there's a series of questions from uh, Professor Nable also. So <laughs> can you comment a little about how TDA can be used when the data is moving? And by moving, we mean evolving in time. This is a brilliant question, because if you think about it, the parameter that we're using is distance, right? Size, meaning. But then you, there, there's time evolving data, right? So for example, if you, if you measure data at this time, measure distances, that's fine. And then you measure again at a different time, perhaps the distance are, are changed, right? So uh, this, will, this will go into um, um, 
uh, what's the thing? Higher dimensional persistent homology. So for a long time, we're stuck with uh, the one dimensional persistent homology because there's no available tool to compute the higher dimensional persistence. But now there is. I think it was last year they launched it. Um, you can actually um, uh, do by filtration now. So we you filter with respect to the distance parameter. You can also filter with another, any other variable. So for say, for example, time. Okay, uh, let's continue on with uh, other questions uh, from anonymous attendee. I'm just curious if TDA can be used also in image analysis. Definitely. So image analysis. So what, let me share you with you one 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 uh, preprint that I had. So if you're familiar with the uh, uh, popular data set MNIST, so it's a collection of digit images, handwritten digit images, and so. What uh, um, what we what we did was we for each um, uh, digit we sampled it and then we computed the the dimension zero uh, persistence there we used the the uh, barcode and then we used the Lumawig of course <laughs> that's an application of our algorithm and we were able to show that you can actually predict higher dimensional features just using lower dimensional features say for example connectivity information. So we were able to classify the digits zero to nine with respectable accuracy using only information about the zero dimensional, i.e. the connectivity information about the digits. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Paul Vincent Botin. So probably it's the same question as a lot of graduate students, uh, beginning graduate students. Can you recommend subjects prerequisite to the TDA? Okay, definitely. So first, the oh, for graduate or undergraduate? For, well, for both undergraduate and graduate, the, the one semester course on topology, the point set is a good prerequisite. And after that, you really have to learn the algebraic stuff. So algebraic uh, topology would be a very, very good uh, prelude to TDA. Okay, uh, what softwares can you recommend studying TDA? Okay, there are many. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. So. Uh, I know there's one now in Python that, uh, so the thing is people develop a particular software for a particular purpose, right? So for example, there's one that specifically uses it for time series data, one for another type. And I think now there's one that uses it for dynamical system data. So I think there's one um, package now in Python and the name is, I forget the name, I think it's Tomato or something. Uh, it's in Python. What it does is it collects all the the uh, state of the art softwares out there, uh, sort of like a, a hub. So you can, it pulls in everything then that you can use for many sorts of data. So it's an open source. It is open source. It's in Python. There's also the TDA package in R. Okay, but in terms of utility, I think the the one in Python is uh, more useful or more powerful at least. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Uh, is TDA work on HIV data? So I just don't know the, the form of the, uh, the data yet. So I can't say uh, uh, in more confidence, um, but as long as it's data that we can, um, uh, if your goal is to find patterns, then definitely yes. Okay, so we have one last question from Professor Hobnable. Are there methods within TDA that detects corners? or tangents uh, or loops? Yes, actually, that's a, a nice question. Again, there's a, a paper, a very nice paper actually that uses a TDA to detect curvature in, in, in manifolds. So I think it was published last year. So, so the, the general interpretation for the barcode is that the, the long bars detect the significant features and the small bars de detect the noise. There was one paper that uh, used TDA actually to show that actually the small bars are also important. They actually detect, detect curvature. So, um, so they used the, the, I think they used landscapes as well, but, and then they, they pair it with another machine learning algorithm, uh, an SVM, and they were able to show that you can actually detect the curvature or in, in that sense, the corners uh, of, of shapes. Okay, so we have more questions coming in. <laughs> so from anonymous attendee, can we use the day to filter signals? Oh, um, filter in, in, in the sense of detect, yes. So there's one, one paper that we did, um, and this is um, with uh, um, 
another group that I worked with at uh, MSRI in Berkeley, um, what we did was um, you have a, a single lead ECG again, so an electrocardiogram. So we used this, the same technique there. And so in, in, so what we were able to show there is that we are able to use uh, TDA features to detect signals for diagnosing atrial fibrillation specifically. Okay, so we, we were able to produce a model that can so give us the single lead and then we'll tell, uh, we'll use TDA features and we were, we were able to show that it's able to predict or in that case, uh, detect signal for the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. I think we have already exhausted all the questions. So if you have uh, more questions, you can email uh, Dr. Paul Ignacio. So his email was given uh, earlier. Okay, so. Okay, so share kasana sir, pero. Okay, ah, sige, sige, share. Paka share na lang. We have more time. Okay. Um, share screen. Okay, so ang aking pong email, if you want to learn or if you want to collaborate on this, uh, uh, Research work, here's my email. I would be very willing to work with you. So, yeah, sa mga students and yung mga researchers. So, actually, yung today, marami siyang applications. Ano? So, uh, marami siyang connections with other uh, research topics. So, a very interesting work and topic. So, thank you again, Paul, for your time. So, let thank me you, just uh, share my screen. So before I give the certificate of appreciation, let me just uh, let me just thank all the the people behind the lecture series committee, and also those people from the UP Baguio offices, the OPA and the SNO for uh, helping us with a lot of technical stuff and for the promotion of the webinar series. Okay, so let me just read the 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 words here. So the certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Paul Samuel P. Ignacio for sharing his time and expertise by serving as a resource speaker during the webinar talk entitled uh, Shapes in Data, an Invitation to uh, TDA. So awarded this 27th of November, 2020 at the College of Science, University of the Philippines, Baguio, Baguio City, Philippines, uh, signed yours truly, uh, Chair of the College of Science Lecture Series Committee and the Dean, uh, Dean Javier, uh, Dean of the College of Science. So we will send you the printed copy and the signed copy soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay. okay, so maybe we could uh, end now. Okay. Thank you again for all those uh, participants and for asking your questions and also for the speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for coming. And do you have more questions? No. <laughs> hey, sir, okay, okay. Na po.